Hello and welcome to another edition of Tuesdays with the Disability Policy for All. Today we have the great fortune to be talking to Lydia Brown, who is an autistic activist and writer about her projects that she'll be talking about. So welcome, Lydia. Thank you very much for having me, Liz. The first question is, what is the Autism Women Project? The Autism Women's Network has been doing a lot of programs online and increasingly face-to-face -to, -face to support and promote autistic women and gender non-conforming people who sometimes feel left out of autistic spaces where mostly men are ruling the game. The project that I've been working on with the Autism Women's Network is an anthology on autism and race, written entirely by autistic people of color. So a lot of us who identify as Asian or Black or Latino or mixed race or Native or Indigenous who don't feel that a lot of autism books or autism resources really represent or include people like us. The anthology features over 60 people who all identify at that intersection of being autistic and being a person of color, writing about our experiences, writing about disability rights work, writing about all of the things that we'd like to be able to say, whether that's during a time when autism is being talked about specifically, or at a time when our voices are being left out of conversations on disability or of conversations on race. Thank you. Can you share with the audience a little bit about the resource on autism and race that you developed? Sure. Um, so the resource is meant to both provide voice and connection to autistic people of color, like myself, who when we read about autism advocacy or the neurodiversity movement or autism and public policy, don't see people like us. We see some fantastic leaders, both those who are autistic, <laughs> those who aren't autistic but working with us, but who by and large are white. So it's to provide a voice and a space for us to connect with people whose stories are like ours, and it's also to educate people who aren't like us. It's to educate autistic people who are white. It's also to educate people who aren't autistic at all. Um, it's also to educate people overall the disability rights movement about our stories, about our experiences, and about the issues that concern us that might not be represented very fairly or very much at all in a movement that's led primarily by white autistic people. Thank you. One of, um, one of President Obama's focus has been on the criminal justice uh, system, and I have noticed that you talk a lot about that in your um, anthology. Is, is there a connection between autistic people and people who end up in the criminal justice system? Just like with any group of disabled people, as more news articles and media studies are showing, autistic people are more likely than non-autistic people to be caught up in the school-to-prison pipeline, to end up referred to juvenile justice, to end up uh, encountering police, potentially being arrested, potentially ending up in prison. But this problem is worsened when you are autistic and a person of color. White autistic people may be targeted by police. I have worked on cases of white autistic children who were taken out of school in handcuffs, uh, and white autistic people who were beaten and tasered by police, but the likelihood of being arrested, of being sent to prison, of being victimized by police violence increases hugely if you are autistic and if you are black or you are Latino. And for autistic people who are white, that, may, that risk may be there, but it's simply not as much. There, is, there are so many connections between criminal justice and disability issues and autism specifically, but 
it's just lost on so many people, both in disability rights and in racial justice, that those who are most likely to be impacted by police violence, by prosecutors' misconduct, or by some kind of abuse in prisons, are those who are both disabled and people of color. And this is something that we have talked about a lot in the anthology. Several people writing in the anthology have spoken about their experiences of being profiled, of being worried about being profiled, of being afraid of their children being shot and killed by the police. Because if you are perceived to be behaviorally different or weird, and you are a black teenager walking down the street, the likelihood that you might be killed by the police jumps exponentially. These are stories that depend upon recognizing that we are both racially affected and disability affected, and that conversation often doesn't happen in disability. When we talk about disability and criminal justice, we're usually talking about it as though it's only a disability issue. But that ends up ignoring the racial aspect of anything involving criminal justice. Thank you. On um, changing the subject a little bit, not totally, but a little bit, um, right now the disability policy seminar that we're um, at right now, and I was wondering what are the legislative issues that you think are important to the autistic community? I think that there are a lot of possible answers to that question. I don't think it's fair to say here's the one thing that is most important and here is these things that are not so important. We have systemic issues with research where most federally funded autism research focuses on causation, etiology, all these questions of what causes autism or how does autism happen to people or what are potential genetic or environmental things associated with whether someone is autistic or not autistic and less than 1% of that federal research money goes to research on lifespan issues. Um, a smaller pro proportion of that amount, it's less than 1%, goes to research on quality of life issues affecting autistic adults. And if we don't have the research, how are we supposed to develop better programs? How are we supposed to develop better services? How are we supposed to do anything to improve our lives over the things that are actually hard, like painful sensory issues, or anxiety, or uh, inability to cope with depression if all the research is about what causes autism instead of how can we support autistic people so that their lives suck less. Like, those are two very different aims of research, but one of them is funded a lot more than the other. There are issues like what kinds of treatments or services are funded, are given um, support through insurance, um, reimbursement rates, through what is covered in different insurance plans, through what is promoted, ranging everywhere from the horrible examples like what the Judge Rotenberg Center does. They electric shock autistic people and other people with disabilities to try to change their behavior, all the way to the most commonly used therapy for autistic people, applied behavior analysis, which is talked about usually as the number one evidence-based treatment for autism, but almost every autistic adult that I know who had ABA as a child now has post-traumatic stress disorder from it as an adult and now struggles much more with so many quality of life and life skills as an adult, specifically because of the ABA that they went through. So what kind of research are we funding? What kind of research do we promote? What kind of services do we provide? What kind of services do we mandate that insurance covers? What kind of services do our schools obligated to provide to children? What kind of services are adult developmental disability services obligated to provide to eligible individuals? Those are important questions. Questions of who has access to health care? Right now, only a couple of states are even considering laws 
that would ban discrimination in organ transplants on the basis of disability. There was a story just last month talking about a three-year-old who may be at risk for having a developmental disability. That's the doctor's words. She may be at risk, and because of that, she should not receive an organ transplant. That kind of legislation is necessary to protect people's lives, to prevent people from dying, all the way to decisions like in Wisconsin, where a few years ago, a doctor ordered an 11-year-old with multiple significant disabilities to be taken off of life-saving pneumonia treatment and left to die because of assumptions about what his life is like as a person with disabilities. So those are some examples of important areas where we could use legislation to benefit not just autistic people, but all people with disabilities. Thank, thank you. If you have any more questions about this or any other policy issues, please go to the AUCD webpage and look for this week's in break. And if you have any questions or comments about this week's Tuesdays with schools, please leave them in the space below. Thank you again, Lydia. Thank you again for having me. Bye. Have a nice